Good evening, friends. My name is Benjamin Scheuer. I'm a songwriter and a playwright. I'm from New York City. I'm also a cancer survivor of stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, thank you, Joy, for the lovely introduction. I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, I've, I'm the writer and performer of a show called The Lion, and I've been performing this piece of theater that I wrote. Uh, it's a piece of musical theater. It's me and a guitar, well, me and seven guitars, actually. And I've been performing it uh, for the last few years. Uh, the last stop of this tour is uh, at the Geffen Playhouse, which is in Westwood in Los Angeles. And uh, I finish on the 19th of February. By the time I finish this, uh, this, this show on the 19th of February, I will have given more than 500 performances of The Lion. And, uh, uh, and the show is very, it's a, it's a true story. Uh, it's about my relationship with my father. It's about a romantic relationship I was in that went well till it went bad. And it was about uh, my treatment, my, my diagnosis with treatment for and cure of uh, advanced stage cancer. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about making good things out of bad things uh, and how, you know, we, we're really all artists and when something is bad uh, and there's really no good to be found in it, cancer for example, not a lot of good to be found in cancer, uh, by writing about cancer uh, I could be an alchemist. And what I mean by that, what I mean by being an alchemist is I could take something bad and turn it into something good. And so I really felt like a magician. Uh, but here's how I'd like to start this evening. I'll, I'll play you the first song in the show, The Lion. Uh, this is a song about my dad, and it's called Cookie Tin Banjo. My father has an old guitar, and he plays me folk songs. My father has an old guitar, and he plays me folk songs. There is nothing I want more than to play like him. He goes to the basement and builds me a cookie tin banjo. He builds me a cookie tin banjo. The strings are made of rubber bands. The strap is an old red necktie. The body is the big round lid of a metal cookie tin. And when he plays his old guitar, I play my cookie tin banjo. Play my cookie tin banjo right along with him. The more we play together, the more I fall in love with music. And I realize that my banjo is a toy that I've outgrown. I want strings of steel and something new and something real. And so he gets me a guitar to call my own. Then dad says to me on this fine afternoon, let's sit on the stairs, I'll teach you to tune. He hands me a pick. One that's little and black, he shows me the G chord. I've never looked back. Now buried somewhere in a closet is my cookie tin banjo. And in my arms is my guitar, my greatest source of joy. And for the life that I have now, I'm grateful to my father, who gave the gift of music to his boy. It started with a simple homemade toy. So that's the first song in the show, The Lion. And the, the way The Lion came to be is, uh, so I did six months of chemotherapy, uh, a dose once every two weeks, uh, in 2011. And so I didn't know how chemotherapy worked. Basically, the way chemotherapy works is uh, I had a, a port, an IV insertion point, uh, put surgically uh, into my chest with a tube that went up behind my ribs, down directly into my heart. And so once every two weeks, I'd get a little, little needle stuck into this port, and they would pump poison into, directly into my heart. Uh, and the kind of chemotherapy I had was called ABVD. It was adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastin, and dicarbazine. Uh, it was, I think, I, I actually know that I'm the only songwriter to use those four words in a song. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so I did this once every, you know, once, once every two weeks, 12 doses for six months. And this is uh, from February 2011 till uh, July 2011. And at the end of it, I was cured. And, and then I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Because... Uh, the, I, was, I was a single guy, and I lived in New York City, and I'm 29 years old, and if, you, if I went on a date, someone would say, hey, so like, what, you know, what have you been doing lately? 
And either I would say, I've had cancer, all I've been doing is chemotherapy, and then that's all we would talk about. Or I wouldn't mention it, and I felt like I was lying. So I felt trapped by my own past, by my own truth, by my own history. And so I thought, well, where's a place that I can both not, not be trapped by this, and also I can take control over this, rather than have it control me. And I thought, I know, I can go to, to an open mic. I'm a songwriter, I can go to an open mic. You go to these coffee shops in New York City, in Greenwich Village, on Bleecker Street, on Cornelia Street, these great little places with couches and sandwiches and hot chocolate, and everybody gets up and confesses their deepest, darkest thing for five minutes, and then you sit down and somebody else does it. And it's culturally the thing everyone does. And I was like, this is great. I'll start going to these open mics and I'm gonna write a little bit, I'm gonna write about my life. I'm gonna write about cancer. I'm gonna take control over this thing that has control over me. Uh, this thing that I, I feel is the thing that separates me most from other people. Maybe I can use it as a way of connection. And so I started doing this. I started going to these open mics and playing a song and suddenly I felt, you know, I just, I sang a song. It felt really, really good to be able to, uh, to share these tunes with people. And, uh, and, you know, you'd sing one song in an open mic, and then i go back to the same place. And they say, hey, Ben, well, we, we like your stuff. Why don't you sing two this time? Or why don't you sing three? Or why don't you come in on Saturday and maybe play a short set of five songs? And so I realized, well, um, I've memorized my songs. I'd better memorize the stuff I'm going to say between songs. Also, because you know, you go to a gig and everybody has original material, but then the stuff they say between songs is always the same as everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, how y'all doing tonight? It's, if they fall back on cliches for the between song banter. And I thought, well, if I'm really a writer and I'm really an entertainer, my job is to not only write the songs to keep people interested, but also to write the between song talking to people in, to, to keep people interested, to really use the skills that I'd learned as a playwright. Uh, and so that's what I started doing. I started to try and build the best coffee shop gig I could and think about it as a piece of theater. I didn't tell people that I was performing a piece of theater. I didn't tell people that I'd memorized my lines. They thought I was just speaking off the cuff. But I realized that I could keep people more entertained. And the great thing about a coffee shop, right, is you know, if you're performing in a theater, everybody's, the audience, th the promise the audience gives is they'll come in, turn off their cell phone, sit down, and shut up for an hour. Uh, and so the stakes are high, but in a coffee shop, nobody does that. And you come in in a coffee shop, if you're bored, you check your phone, you go pee, you talk to your friend, you get another beer, you get a cup of coffee. And so I could tell when I wasn't entertaining people. I could tell when people started getting bored. And I think, great, that's my opportunity to rewrite that spot. Actually, it's probably my opportunity to write the spot three minutes before then, because that's probably when they started getting bored, and it just kicked in. Uh, and so, um, and so I started writing these tunes, and then I got invited uh, to the Goodspeed Theater, which is in Connecticut, for January 2013, a year after I'd been playing these coffee shop gigs. And um, and they asked me. They said, Ben, you know, we know you're a songwriter and you're a playwright. We're actually we're paying writers to write new pieces of theater. Do you want to come? Now, now, I didn't think I was making a piece of theater. I thought I was just writing a coffee shop gig, but I was happy to take their money, so I lied to them. And, <laughs> and I was like, sure, it's this one person autobiographical musical about my dad and cancer. And, <laughs> and, um, and I went up to the Goodspeed. And so here's, here's how um, developmental theater, here's how that business model actually works. Like, how is it that a theater can pay a bunch of writers to just make stuff, and, and the theater owns none of it? Well, here's how. Uh, the hope is that if they pay 50 writers to hang out for a month and write things, one of those writers is going to write Annie, you know, or Guys and Dolls, a big hit. And then the theater can go to its sort of rich old people and say, hey, rich old people, give us a million dollars. We just helped make Guys and Dolls. And the people, the rich old people are thrilled because they helped make Guys and Dolls. The theater is thrilled because they're getting funding to support artists. The artists are thrilled because they're getting paid to make new work. Everybody's happy. And so I got invited up to the Goodspeed Theater where I met Sean Daniels. He's a theater director. And Sean was working with two guys who'd written a Tony Award-winning Broadway show called The Urine Town. Uh, Sean was working with Mark Holman and Greg Potus, these tremendous and, and very well-known songwriters. And Sean heard me in my few little songs uh, in my sort of coffee shop style gig when I was trying to make good out of bad. And he said, hey man, you know, here's the thing. I feel like I really kind of understand your story. Uh, I'd like to help direct your show. And I was like, well, oh. Mr. Famous Director Man, that's not, 
how would you, and, I, and I thought, well, I better ask a sensible professional question. I was like, so how would you direct my show? And he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? What do, I, what do I mean? How would you, how would you direct my show? And he's like, oh, Ben, you don't have a show. You have like two songs now. And, you know, I'll help you make the show you want to make. I'll help you outline it. Uh, and I'll help you tell uncomfortable truths. He's like, because I th the thing is, the thing, often the things that we think separate us the most are the things that actually connect us. Not because this, your scary thing is my scary thing, but because we all have that thing within us. And ultimately, when you show somebody the thing about yourself you don't want anyone to know, it gives them permission to feel that about themselves too. And this was so clever. This was so clever. And so Sean and I worked and worked uh, through all of 2000. We're going to play a little video in a second, by the way, uh, whoever is. Um, Thank you. Uh, we worked and worked through 2013. And then in August 2013, we went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It's the biggest theater festival in the world. It's in Scotland. And um, we're, we're going to play weather, something called Weather the Storm next. Uh, not this one. This is Cure. The Weather the Storm is the cartoon. And, um, and, and so I started, you know, I, I did the dress rehearsal in a, in a little theater. Uh, just one chair, one microphone. There wasn't even a guitar microphone. And there was um, uh, about four people in the audience first night uh, for our dress rehearsal. And I did the show. And it's very much about my relationship with my dad and how my father taught me to play. You know, the song I played earlier, Cookie Tin Banjo, is the first song in the show. And Sean said, oh, man, Ben, you know, you're actually missing a song. We open tomorrow. Today was the dress rehearsal. Can you write a new song for tomorrow? Um, <laughs> Dad's got to bestow wisdom. Dad's got to sing a song bestowing wisdom. Go write a song where dad bestows wisdom. Uh, and the wisdom should be about how to deal with things when they're tough. Not fix them, but deal with them. You have 24, 23 hours. Go. <laughs> And so I went and I wrote a song that night, a song called Weather the Storm. I've since made uh, an animated music video for this video, and I would like to share it with you. Here is the video for the song Weather the Storm. Temperatures yesterday reached 27 Celsius in Gravesend, Kent, but those temperatures are easily going to be eclipsed. They're probably much more than 31 degrees. It's the thing of a heat wave building. As we drag up all this very warm air from the near continent, in fact, by Wednesday, we could see temperatures go as high as 35 degrees across London and the southeast. Before we get there, though, there will be plenty of warm, humid, sunny weather today across England and Wales. Cloud break. Gather round, children, come here to my side and Sit by the fire where it's warm I'll tell you something was once told to me About the way that we weather the storm It's not how long the rain falls Or how hard the wind blows Or how deep is the snow in the road nor the balance we fake when we feel the ground shake And we think that our world will explode It's the help that we give, it's the love that we live It's our pride in the friendships we form It's the courage we show facing things we don't know It's the way that we weather the storm If you try to stand tall, but you slip and you fall In the earth is the sound of the stars Truth gets revealed when you're broken and healed Every heart is made stronger by scars It's not how long the rain falls Or how hard the wind blows Or how deep is the snow in the road 
Nor the balance we fake when we feel the ground shake And we think that our world will explode It's the help that we give It's the love that we live It's our pride in the friendships we form It's the courage we show Facing things we don't know It's the way that we weather the storm So go on your journeys, be bold and be brave Be lions, my boys, and be strong And when it is such that it all feels too much Then remember the words to this song It's not how long the rain falls Or how hard the wind blows Or how deep is the snow in the road Nor the balance we fake When we feel the ground shake And we think that our world will explode It's the help that we give It's the love that we live It's our pride in the friendships we form It's the courage we show Facing things we don't know It's the way that we weather the storm It's the way that we weather the storm Yeah, so I made that video with a director animator named Peter Bainton, he's a British guy, and uh, a, a really, really talented artist. He went to Cambridge and studied architecture and oil painting, uh, and then realized, oh, I like making three-dimensional worlds exist in two dimensions. Uh, I also like telling stories. I should be an animator. Uh, and uh, how's, Joy's asked me to move my chair so the light falls better. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, it's important to me to, to collaborate, to work in different mediums, and to tell stories uh, all different ways. And so the song Weather the Storm, when I wrote it in the show The Lion, it was my father bestowing wisdom. It was my, a song that my, my father sung. And when I decided I wanted to record the soundtrack for the show The Lion, rather than the traditional way of making a musical theater record, which is let's just record the show, and then take the songs and, sh and you know, cut out all the talking and just take the songs and give it to people. I thought that seemed, that seemed like the old way to do things. And for me, the new way to do things is, okay, well, when I created this show, The Lion, I gave the material to the director, Sean Daniels, and told him to do whatever he wanted. If I make a record, I should do the same thing. I should give the material to a record producer, Jeff Crayley, and have him do whatever he wanted. So in the show, it's just me and a guitar, but on record, he brought in, uh, Josh Dion to play drums. He brought in Chris Morrissey to play bass. Gene Rowe to do the backing vocals. And so the track sounds, sounds quite different. It takes advantage of the recorded medium. And similarly, when I made this video uh, for Weather the Storm with, with Peter, we thought, well, in the show, the narrator is a father singing to his kids. But for a video, we can make the story completely different. If it's about weathering the storm, and some, you know, people having their own troubles, perhaps that other people can't see, we thought, how can we use animation to personify this? How can we do that? And, and both Pete and I really loved the idea of somebody who just had the wind blowing on them and on nobody else. And animation, it's so easy to do that in animation. If you're making a real movie, it costs you so much money to do it, but in animation, you just draw a picture of somebody who's in a windstorm and nobody else is. Uh, and so, suddenly the, you know, the single from the show, the single track sounds different than the show, and the music video has nothing to do with it. And so I'm, my, my interest is in collaborating and in working with a lot, of different, a lot of different artists to take moments of difficulty and turn them into art in maybe ways that other people can, can see and other people can relate to, you know, particularly given the, the, the current political climate. This song has really taken on a new meaning to me when I sing it every night for a group, a group of people 
You know the line, it's the courage we show facing things we don't know. It's the way that we weather the storm. I think that that feeling of not knowing what's going to happen to us or to our friends and family or to the world is a really universal one, but one that can be really isolating. And so putting it into words has been, has been really important to me. Uh. This, by the way, this is the record, Songs from the Lion. Yes, it's an actual record. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Uh, if, if you'd like to hear the record, this record, I don't have um, copies of it with me today, but it's on iTunes, and you can also order the vinyl or the CD, or just go and listen, listen to the tracks before you buy it. That, that's on, uh, on iTunes or on my website, which is benjaminshore.com. Uh, I, was, I was photographed once a week when I was undergoing chemotherapy as well. And here's why. Uh, my doctor told me, he said, Ben, listen, you know, when you get chemotherapy, you're going to get better on the inside and you're going to look worse on the outside. And as a person, I found this horrifying. As an artist, I was like, ooh, that sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> and so I asked my friend Raya Lerner, who's a photographer who teaches at the uh, International Center of Photography at ICP. Uh, I'd asked her if she would come and photograph me once a week. And she did. And uh, we made a journal, oh, excuse me, we made a book of these images. We took 27 of these images, and I'm gonna show some of them to you now. Uh, the book is called Between Two Spaces. And so here are a few of the images from Between Two Spaces. This is the first photograph that Raya took of me. And in the song, Weather the Storm, there's a line, truth gets revealed when you're broken and healed. Every heart is made stronger by scars. Now that's not a metaphor to me. Uh, when I got this port, put into my chest, I literally have a scar over my heart. Uh, so the chemotherapy could go there. You can see it in this photograph. You can see where this surgically implanted port was put. Uh, and so sometimes when we say the most specific thing, the thing we think is most specific to us, it can take on metaphorical meaning. My friend Sam Wilmot is a wonderful songwriter. He teases me. He says, Ben, even your metaphors are just the thing, <laughs> you know? Uh, so let's see the next photograph. This is when I was cutting off all my hair right before I started chemotherapy, uh, knowing that it was going to start to fall out. Where's the next one? Yeah, so that's a better image where you can see, uh, you can see this, port, this port that's in my, in my chest. And something that became really important to me when I was ill was clothing. Uh, because when I would go to the hospital, I suddenly was in the world of the sick, and I was given clothes of the sick. I was given that green hospital gown, that ubiquitous gown that is the uniform of patients. And so when I was in the hospital, this is what I had to wear. And so suddenly when I could choose what I wanted to wear, uh, uh, it was one of the only choices I could make. When I got up in the morning, there wasn't a lot that I had control over. One of the things over which I had control was clothing. And so clothing became very important. Let's see what's next. That's the, the doctor's office where I, where I got my treatment. There was something strangely ominous about the octagon. Uh, that is a photograph of me getting chemotherapy. Uh, and this scene, to me, there was nothing beautiful in it ever. I never, I could not find, I really tried hard to find beauty in getting chemotherapy. Maybe there's some metaphor. Couldn't find it. And then Raya took a picture of it. And I showed it to other people. And, and I heard the phrase, me too. And my friend Andrew Lippa is a Broadway songwriter and has been a mentor to me. And Andrew Lippa said to me, the most spiritual words in English are me too. He said, when you take the thing that is just horrible and there's nothing good in it and you share it with somebody else and they say me too, suddenly we feel a little bit less alone. We feel a little less alone. And so this photo, I don't like looking at this photograph. I, you know, I don't have it up in my bedroom wall or anything. But, but to be able to share it with other folks and have that pain be a little more distributed and a little more understood. That, that has brought me great, great joy. Let's see, what's next? Yeah, there's the, the clothing that I could choose. There's the clothing that I could choose. I could choose myself a nice jacket. And there's the clothing that I couldn't choose. And what's next? I guess that's, oh, this image can't be loaded. <laughs> well, you get the idea. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the book, Between Two Spaces. Uh, and uh, they're $45, and they're to raise, uh, raise money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Profits go to the, go to the LLS. Uh, we've raised thousands of dollars so far. Uh, and so I would, I would urge you all, uh, they're, they're for sale just, just cash today. I'm afraid we don't have credit card sales. So if you have $45 cash, uh, 
I would I, I thank you in advance for uh, for supporting a very very good cause. Now, I showed these photographs and this book between two spaces. By the way, if you'd like to get a copy not today of this book, if you'd like to get one at home, you can order it at between two spaces. Dot com, between two spaces dot com. I showed a copy of this book to Peter Bainton, the animator, director, who made the first movie that I showed you, who made this video for Weather the Storm. And Peter thought it was marvelous. And, and, and he and I were chatting. He loved Raya's photography. He said it reminded him of Horst P. Horst or Helmut Newton or Maplethorpe, you know, these, these uh, wonderful, wonderful black and white photographers. And Raya took these photographs with an old 1970s Roloflex medium format camera. And one thing I told Pete about, I said, you know, when you're getting chemotherapy, uh, the chemotherapy invades your body and kills your cells to save you. Whereas when you have cancer, the cancer invades your body and kills your cells to kill you. And when you're getting both, when both are happening at the same time, it's really hard to tell which is which. Which thing is killing you to kill you and which thing is killing you to save you. And I told this to Peter, and he said, well, that's really interesting. Do you think we could make a music video with that idea uh, for one of your songs that's in the show, The Lion, and in, on the record, Songs from the Lion, it's a song called Cure. And he said, do you think, let's make a black and white video, like a film video that looks like photography, where a body is being invaded and you don't know if it's good or bad. And I said, oh, cool, you wanna make a, a film video. I said, Pete, have you ever done anything beyond animate? Have you ever made a film video before? He said, nope. <laughs> I, he, he said, but I want to write and direct this movie with you. And I said, okay. And so we made a video called Cure. And this video premiered on the New York Times health page. Uh, and they'd never premiered a music video before. And that's what was exciting to me about it. You know, I could take a, a, an artist, a visual representation from Peter and a musical representation from me and Jeff Crayley, my record producer, and use it as a way for me as a cancer patient to feel a little bit more understood. Maybe I could share it with doctors. Maybe I could share it with caregivers. Maybe I could share it with other people who know people who have cancer who don't quite understand what it's like, and maybe this could shed a little bit of light on it. So here's the video for the song Cure. Into the room and in the chair Under the flat fluorescent glare Make sure the needle is secure Hung from a bag might flow the cure And maybe I'm an optimist but I don't think I'm wrong That at 85% my odds are actually pretty strong Twelve treatments in I'll go get scanned to see if it's worked the way they planned To see if I'm finally cancer free To see if they found a cure for me Back to the office mid-July To learn if I'm actually going to die To learn if I lose or if I win Tests have been done, results are in They are the final culmination of the panic and the fear That I have fought so hard to deal with this entire goddamn year I'm gonna end up like my dad the doctor will tell me it looks bad It's deep in your brain, your spinal cord Then, he says, then It worked, you're cured Heavy stuff, <laughs> heavy stuff. I, told, I, I think I told some of my friends I was gonna make a single and a music video from this song. And they were like, are you crazy? Who's gonna, was you gonna play that on the radio? And I was like, no. And they, they said, but that's not, that's not you know, a pop hit. And I said, I know, but maybe, maybe there's, you know, maybe, maybe some people will connect to it. And so I wrote the first half of that song while I was undergoing chemotherapy. 
when I didn't know how the song was going to end. And then I wrote the second half of the song later, uh, when, after I'd been cured. And in the show, The Lion, the, uh, the first two halves of the lyric are actually bookended by an 11 minute section where I really get into it and talk about what it's like to have can what it was like for me to have cancer. I talk about it in, in the present tense. And that's something that, that's really interesting to me as a songwriter. You know, you, as a songwriter, you can write songs in the past tense, I had cancer. You can write songs in the present tense, I have cancer. You can write songs in the future tense, I will have cancer. A audiences are, are smart, they get it. You know, the song Cookie Tin Banjo that I played before. I don't say, my father had an old guitar and he played me folk songs. I say, my father has an old guitar and he plays me folk songs. And so I'm bringing to the present tense uh, what was the past. And in musical theater, that's often the right choice. Almost always is it the right choice. When you sing songs about the past in musical theater, your songs are cathartic rather than dramatic. They're, this happened and I'm telling you about it. In the theater, you want to see stuff happening now. You want it to exist in the moment. And that was one of the big problems of The Lion, actually. The, one of the big problems of writing the show is where is the drama about our main character dying? Because obviously he doesn't. He's here singing to you about it. Uh, and yeah, how, where's the drama? And so I asked my friend Ivo Sturton, who's a wonderful novelist, I said, what do I do about this? This is problematic. And he said, well, what if Ben dies in the show? And I said, what do you mean? He said, what if you always have the possibility that you write, you're writing the character of Ben, he's you, sure, but you're writing this character. What if you're always maintaining the possibility that he can die? If that possibility exists to you, it will definitely exist to the audience. And if it doesn't exist to you, the show will fall flat. And Ivo was absolutely right. And so I, uh, I was working on this and I was dared by my friend Shana Taub, who's a wonderful songwriter in New York, to write one true couplet, a couplet is a pair of lines where they each rhyme, to write one true couplet about cancer. And so I worked for a long time. This was very scary for me. Uh, I, I was told by a songwriting teacher, you want to write a good song, write what you don't want people to know about you. You want to write a great song, write what you don't want to know about yourself. And so when my friend Shana Taub asked me to write a couplet about cancer, I, uh, I went to her house and I said, I've done it. I've written a, can uh, I've written a couplet. And she just said, what's the couplet? I said, now there's blood and shit pooling round my toes as I unclog my bowels with the shower hose. And she said, great, now go write another one. <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean? And I was expecting the world to end when I wrote this couplet. It's such an embarrassing and awful line. And she said, no, that's, that's actually, that's beautiful writing. That's good writing. That's writing when you're telling us the truth and you're getting out of the way. You're not, put, you're not being the critic of your own actions. You're just saying what happened. And so I did this again and again and again and I kept writing couplets. And I've had the wonderful, op wonderful opportunity to speak to oncologists to speak to cancer doctors who have come to the show and have said to me, wow, you know, you've really helped me understand a little bit more what it's like for the patients. Because as an oncologist, my job is to give them all the medicine and save their lives and save as many people as I can. But the sort of day-to-day -day mundanity of it, uh, you know, like how it affects your sex life, how it affects your sleep, like that's ultimately not as important to me in my day-to-day -day rounds as, w as if I can save your life. But it's good to know. It's good to know for me because that helps me do my job better. And so that felt really valuable. That writing this song, I didn't know what good it was gonna do for me to write this couplet down other than it was gonna help me get it out of my system and just be done with it. But to feel that maybe I'd contributed positively to help patients who have come after me, that's been really extraordinarily valuable. And I'm so grateful for the tools, you know, the guitar and the notebook. And so, after Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, uh, when, it was the, when the Lion was at the Fringe Festival in Scotland in August 2013, uh, it won the award at the end of the festival for best lyrics in the festival. And then London came a calling. And we, we re I rewrote the show and Sean and I put it up again in London having rewritten a bunch of songs, cut some of the songs. And, um, and then the Manhattan Theatre Club in New York came a call, and this is a big old, big old theater. And we opened in New York in June 2014, and the show won the Drama Desk Award for Best Solo Performance uh, on or off Broadway. And this, I share this award with Ian McKellen, with Whoopi Goldberg, uh, with Billy Crystal, it's pretty wonderful. And, and since then, I've been 
on tour, nonstop, but with the show The Lion uh, around the United States and in England. And uh, my, my family lives in London. I've got two younger brothers uh, and, uh, and my mother. And they live in London. And maybe the, the, greatest, the greatest musical day of my life was when um, an American folk artist called Mary Chapin Carpenter came to see the lion and invited me on tour with her in the UK. And so I went and visited my, uh, visited my mother and my brothers. And then we played the first gig in London at a venue called the Royal Albert Hall. And, and it was, I, I, was, I was opening for Mary Chapin. She was playing with, a, with a, a symphony orchestra and I was playing by myself with an acoustic guitar. And uh, my mother and my brothers were in the audience. And I think finally my mother realized what I did was a real job. <laughs> uh, and so one of the songs I played at the Royal Albert Hall was a song, was the title track in the show, The Lion, which I'd like to, uh, I'd like to play for you now. I'm gonna tune my guitar a little bit. You know, when, when Ravi Shankar, the sitar player fellow who was playing, he used to play with the Beatles. Uh, when he was playing at Woodstock, he was on stage and he was tuning his sitar. And it takes a long time to tune a sitar. And people weren't really uh, familiar with sitar music. And so at the end of when he was finished tuning, he got this huge round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the song. I'll, uh, I'll leave you with this and then we can, we can chat a little bit and you guys can ask some questions. This is the song, it's the title track from the show. It's called The Lion. And it is, of course, a true story. When my mother still was young, her father died from too much wine. His parents both were hunted in the jungle. She moved into the city in her 20s, met my father, he courted her. They fell in love and they married. Then on a Tuesday, April morning, his brilliant brain stopped working. My brothers, mom and I all sat round crying when it occurred to me that I'd do well to lead our little pride. And so I tried to find my roar and be a lion. I always show my teeth when I am smiling. I only say I love you when I'm sure. Inside my gentle paws, I've got some devastating claws and I'm learning what it means to really roar. To protect them from the storm, keep them safe and keep them warm. Music was the fire that I shared. It taught me when in fear to be open and sincere because sometimes being brave is being scared. And at the risk of getting burned, I tried to guide the pride to learn to find their own ideas of fire and fan the flame with other stuff to do and see. They left the music all to me. The things that made us lions were not the same. I always show my teeth when I am smiling. I only say I love you when I'm sure. Inside my gentle paws, I've got some devastating claws, and I'm learning what it means to really roar. When all the cubs grew up and we were spread around the earth, I found one day that I'd grown very sick. My bones were filled with holes. My belly hung in rolls. And I was bald where once my mane was thick. I slept and was ashamed. I was quiet. I was tamed. Then they came and stayed and helped me heal inside. And though I had to learn once more to be a lion without a roar, it's not the roar that makes the lion. It's the pride. And I always show my teeth when I am smiling. I only say I love you and I'm sure. Inside my gentle paws, I've got some devastating claws, and I'm learning what it means to really roar. I always show my teeth when I am smiling. I only say I love you when I'm sure. Inside my gentle paws, I've got some devastating claws, and I'm learning, I'm learning what it means to really roar.
Thank you very much indeed, friends. So let's chat a little bit. Does anybody have uh, any questions? Don't be shy. Start us off. Yes. Yeah, what are my plans to do? What are my plans next? Well, uh, so I have, I have two big creative projects, and then I have two big uh, uh, personal projects. Uh, my, my big creative projects are making, are making a new record of songs that I've written while I've been on the road. And I'm also writing a new piece of theater. This time it's for a cast. Uh, I'm not going to be in it. I want to have dinner at 8 o'clock, <laughs> <laughs> which I haven't done in a long time. And uh, that, sh that, that new musical, uh, it's been commissioned by the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts. And it's going to be about a fella called Peter Mark Roget, R-O-G-E-T. Peter Mark Roget, if you don't know who he is, look him up. He, uh, he has changed your life without your knowing it. Uh, and, and then personally, uh, I'm, I'm getting a dog next month. <laughs> He's a Labradoodle. <laughs> He's very cute. And I'm getting married in August. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm going to stay at home and hang out with my dog and hang out with my wife and sit at my piano and write some, write some new songs. Thank you for asking. Yeah. When a friend has cancer, what is the correct response? The, th the things that I really appreciated when people said, man, that is shitty, that sucks, that is, I'm so sorry to hear that. And when people said, when people said let me know what I can do, they better have been able to back it up. <laughs> and I understood, I understood some people were busy. Uh, but when somebody said, anything I can do, you tell me. Often it was like, yeah, come over and take out my trash while I'm sleeping. That would be so helpful. And a lot of people did that. And then some people I'd ask them to do it, and they'd be like, well, I don't know. And I'm not friends with those people anymore. <laughs> um, when people made medical suggestions to me that I didn't ask for, man, I was, oh, you know, sugar is really good, bad, terror, you know, like just started making suggestions. Uh, that I didn't appreciate. Uh, because I had, my, I had my doctors with whom I was working, and I knew what my course was. If I would ask somebody, you know, hey, can, can you help me research this or what do you think about this? Uh, that was really useful. But most often it was, it was people showing up and being kind, just, you know, a text message, hey, just wanted to let you know I was thinking about you. You know, just wanted to send love. And, and the best thing, man, the best thing was no need to write back. Because, you know, the first time I get 100 emails, and I was like, fuck, now do I need to write back to everyone? Oh, man, I don't need it. So when somebody would say, just wanted to let you know, is thinking about you, sorry you're not well, I love you a lot, no need to write back. If there's anything I ever can do, here's my phone number. You know, that, that was really cool. There's also a, this is great, there's a set of cards that a cancer survivor made, which are hilarious, which can be bought on the internet. I don't remember what her name is, but I bet if you Google funny cancer cards, it says stuff like, I promise to never make annoying medical suggestions. I'm really sorry you're sick. <laughs> you know, like, it's all the things. Uh, those, are, those are great. But yeah, just people showing up, just knowing that you're not totally alone. People sending, like, people making food or asking what I needed to eat or asking if I needed the trash taken out. Or peop and people going with me to chemotherapy. So when somebody said, if you ever need somebody to go with you to chemotherapy and sit there, like it's really boring going to chemotherapy. It's just really boring. And so having somebody just come along and not like have them freak out, just have them sit there and just be cool. That was lovely. That was really lovely. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really important and really wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, what's your name? Liz, hello. So Liz, Liz asked, Liz says that she's a, a performer and an interpreter of other people's work and doesn't have a ton of experience writing. Uh, what, what is a good way to tell one's own story when one doesn't have a lot of experience doing it and is there value to it? Well, uh, in the is there value to it, yeah, 100%. And I think the more specifically we tell our story, the more universally it's understood. When we try to extrapolate how everybody else would feel, I think we're kind of lost. But when we tell our deeply, deeply, deeply specific experience, and like the things that happened, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, or even better yet, this happens, and this happens, and this happens in the present tense. Uh, uh, well, s thinking about who your audience is, is always a really great idea. When I wrote The Lion, Sean Daniels, the director, said to me, 
why don't you tell it to, imagine you're telling it to a friend. You know, literally pick someone you know who maybe you haven't seen in a while, who you feel comfortable with, and tell it to them. Like, how would you tell them the thing that happened? And oftentimes, instead of writing it with a paper, I would just take out my iPhone, press record, and just tell it as if it were a story. And then listen back to that, and then type it up. And then read out what I'd written, and then work on it. I mean, most, you asked about this, you know, when, you, when a phrase pops into your head. So we call that inspiration, right? I think, I think inspiration is deeply overrated. And here's what I mean. When inspiration comes, that's great. It's great when it comes. But we can't bank on it. You know, I put, for me, writing is putting my butt in the chair every day and working. And most of what I write is not good. And that's fine. And then it's rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it. Uh, the writer Verlaine Klinkenberg uh, has a book called Several Short Sentences About Writing, which is a great book that I'd recommend to anybody who wants to make anything with words, really make anything with anything. But Several Short Sentences About Writing is a great book about making things. And he talks about the fallacy of flow, that when you read something that flows beautifully as a reader, that we think, oh, well, that must have flowed so easily out of the writer. Well, there could not be bigger nonsense, right? In order to make something flow, you slave over every comma in order to make it easier. So you're, like a, you're making furniture. How many you know, times do you sand it and varnish it to make, to make those seams disappear? It's just a ton of work. And so those, fra when they, those phrases pop into your head, great, write them down. Often. For me, the things that pop into my head, I never end up keeping, you know? And I will rework them and rework them. And the thing about, you know, and drafts. For me, my drafts were coffee shops, bringing them and seeing what worked and seeing what didn't. Uh, every time I write anything new, I always show it to a lot of different people and I ask them for their thoughts. Now, the best way I like to get a note on something, if somebody has a thought, is for them to say, I noticed this. Like, I noticed your second verse. To me, that's the same as, I loved your second verse, or I hated your second verse, or here's how I would have done your second verse, which is always a terrible suggestion. Um, uh, I like when people point out what's wrong with my thing, what they noticed, rather than offer suggestions, which allows me an opportunity to go back and look at it. And simultaneously, how to take a note. Sean Daniels, the director of my show, The Lion, said there is only one way to take a note, which is say thank you and write something down, no matter what the note is. Because you can take it later, you can get, you can, the thing you write down could be this person's a total idiot and their note was ridiculous. <laughs> or you could, but write it down because for me, when I, when somebody points out the big flaw in my thing, uh, I have three very quick reactions in succession. Uh, and, it, and it probably about a second and a half, my three reactions are, fuck you, I suck, okay, what's the note? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so that is, I found, the best way. And often if you send, say, you know, you're writing a, uh, say it's a monologue or a poem, and you send it to three different people, and they all notice the third line. Maybe they all have different thoughts on the third line, but they all notice the third line. There's probably something to it. There's probably something to dig in in your third line. Uh, and when people start noticing punctuation and tiny little things, that's when it's good. When, when, the note, when the note is, I notice the whole thing and I notice myself not understanding it, then, you know, that's usually the first draft. That's the note in the first draft, like, okay. You know, asking yourself, what is this about? And, not, and I mean that differently than what's happening in this song. You know, the song can be two people meet and they fall in love uh, and then they buy a house with a swimming pool. Uh, but so that's, that's not what the song is about. That's what happens in the song. But what is it about? Well, what's the angle of the song? Maybe it's about growing old. Maybe it's about nostalgia. Maybe it's about swimming and water and nature. You know, what's it about? When you ask what's it about when you're making a thing, try to say it in as few words as possible. If you can say it in one word, that's brilliant. Two, that's, that's great. And that's why I'll turn you back to the show I'm writing, Peter Marc Roger. So Peter Marc Roger wrote, uh, he, he decided to organize the entire English language by idea. Uh, alphabetically is a dictionary. By idea is, well, he named it after the, the Latin word for treasure. Does anybody know what that word is? Thesaurus. Thesaurus, that's right, yeah. And Peter Marc Roger sold 40 million copies of Roger's Thesaurus, so that guy was doing something right. Yeah, I think, Give it a shot and realize that your first draft is going to be terrible and give yourself total permission for that, and that's okay. And then do another draft and another draft. I like to do it by hand. 
uh, rather than on a computer. Just for me, writing the same thing again and again, I really get a different understanding of it physically. But writing on a computer is great. Some people like to write on their iPhone when they're sitting on the, I guess there isn't really the subway here as much as there is in New York. Uh, but there's, there's no wrong way to do it. Some people just say it directly into their phone. Uh, th there's, there's so many stories to be, to be told. And really, I believe so wholeheartedly that everybody's story is important, especially the stuff you think nobody wants to hear. That's, that's where I would start. Follow the fear. Follow the fear. Yeah, how did I find out that I, had, uh, that I actually had cancer? Well, so I had I'd been dating a, a woman for six and a half years, and our relationship had fallen apart. And she'd moved to another country, and we'd sort of hadn't broken up, but she'd just gone on a very long trip and then never really came back. Uh, and so I was feeling, I was losing weight. Uh, the, I was sweating through my sheets at night, and the left side of my lower back hurt when I drank alcohol. And so I went to a doctor, and he was like, you know, you're, have you, what's something going on in your life? And I said, yeah, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend in six and a half years. And he was like, you're fine. We don't need to do any blood work. So... The, the thing I've learned now is always be your own advocate uh, when you're sick. If you know, you, you know your own body better than, better than anybody. And so uh, if you know something is amiss, if you know your chemistry has changed, and you're not sure quite how, but you know it has, and a doctor says to you, you're fine, and you think maybe they're not quite right, keep asking questions. Talk to someone else. Or say to your doctor, you know, uh, I, I don't think we figured it out yet. Let's keep looking. Let's keep looking. And if, and, if, and if they don't believe you, talk to another doctor, really. Talk to another doctor. No, no, nobody gets it right all the time. Uh, and so uh, this was, a, a few months later, I was running through Grand Central Station, uh, and I slipped and I fell. And I spent the next day in bed, banged up and bruised. And the following day, I go to my doctor, uh, who sends me for some x-rays. And when we sit down to discuss the results of these x-rays, he looks serious. Uh, he looks scared, actually. And he says, listen, Ben, you have lytic lesions in your pelvis. You broke your, your pubic bone in three places. And the reason you did is you have lytic lesions in your pelvis. And I said, lytic le I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what that is. And he says, something's eating your bones. I said, what, like a good kind of an eating? Like, is there a good kind? Of and so I was sent for more tests, including a PET scan. And a PET scan is the scan that we use to to detect cancer. And the way a PET scan works is the patient's injected with a radioactive isotope, uh, which attaches itself to cells. And then the machine, the, the CAT scan, PET scan machine, can read how quickly these cells are reproducing. And so cancer is the problem of cell reproduction, at least the type of cancer I had, it, cells are growing far too quickly and have mutated. And uh, so when I got this PET scan, it showed that my cells were growing very quickly indeed, and then I had, uh, I had cancer. In order to determine the type of cancer, they'd have to biopsy. Uh, but it basically, I, my PET scan lit up like a big old Christmas tree. Uh, from my neck, down my left side, to just about my knee. I, there was cancer detected in my spine, my lung, my ribs, my lymph nodes, my ischium, acetabulum. Uh, it, was, it was all over. And so they did a, a, a biopsy where they put a uh, needle, well, needle is an understatement. It's more like a javelin. Uh, <laughs> javelin through my groin and up into this, into the bone, and then put, it, the needle was so big it was hollow, they actually put a second needle through it. Took a sample of this bone, and, and by the way, this was between the PET scan and the biopsy. Uh, the PET scan was on Friday, and the biopsy was on Tuesday. And they said I was gonna get the results of the biopsy on Friday. So I had a week when they're like, listen kid, you definitely have cancer. We're not sure what kind. It could be a kind where you'll have a lousy six months and then you'll be fine. Or, or it could be fatal and there's nothing we can do to save your life. Uh, it could be anything in between. We're not sure what it is we need to biopsy. So I had the weirdest weekend of my life where I didn't feel that sick, but I went and spent all my money on a stereo system. Because I was like, well, either I'm going to die, in which case, fine, you know, I don't need all my money, or I'm going to live, in which case I'll have a great stereo system. <laughs> and they biopsied it, and they sent, they sent this off, and they said, well, this is actually the best of all possible cases. You have something called Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is anywhere between 85 and 98% uh, curable. It's more like 98%, but of course, uh, medical studies, you know, th the most recent medical study we have is from a few years ago, because it takes 
time to get all the results for a medical study now. You know, by the time we get the results now, and we've done it on lots and lots and lots of people, it's already years old. And so 85 to 98 percent is closer to 98 percent. And so six months later, I was, I was cured. I was treated in New York City at uh, Cornell New York Hospital on 72nd Street. I had a wonderful doctor named Dr. Jeff Tepler. Uh, and Dr. Jeff Tepler shows up as a cartoon penguin in another animated video I've done for that song, The Lion. So if you'd like, there, there, that's one, that one's on my website too, on benjaminshore.com. With Jeff, my, my thanks to uh, my life-saving doctor, Jeff Tepler, as a penguin. <laughs> Surely, uh, yes, a very good question, which is how, how do we find validation both within our community and ourselves when we're working in something that perhaps our community doesn't understand is, is a, a vocation? Uh, this gentleman's a, a filmmaker, uh, and I think most people understand movies uh, to be sort of, you know, big, hour and a half long, multi-million dollar uh, creative projects where, of course, you know, most of the movies we make are any you know lower and lower and lower down to what you make on your iPhone, and a really good filmmaker can of course make a make a movie on their iPhone. That's that's a great question, man. I mean, I think having a community is a really valuable thing to at least have. Uh, for me, as a songwriter, having other songwriters with whom I spent time, who are also working in the same job. So when you know our mothers would say, you know, who comes to these gigs of yours, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, I think it's. I, I acknowledge that my mother doesn't know what it's like for a songwriter uh, and doesn't, you know, it took me 10 years of writing and writing and writing and writing before anybody paid any attention to the work that I did. And every single song I wrote, every single piece of theater I attended, every single book I read and record I listened to was part of this creative pursuit. And it's hard to explain to people that watching a movie is part of your job. It really is. And it's also hard to explain to people that for me as a writer, I can write about two hours a day or two and a half hours a day. That's a full day's work for me. Uh, I, I will dedicate that two hours and then I'm done. Then I'll go get lunch or hang out with friends or read. Uh, similarly, when I'm performing, I can't really write that much. My, uh, uh, it was Mary Chapin Carpenter who said, listen, you can't be, if you're a full-time writer and you're a full-time performer, you have two full-time jobs and nobody can sustain that. Uh, and so, you know, people say, why aren't you writing when you're doing your gig? You're just going and doing your gig for an hour a night. Why don't you write? What, like, you're just screwing around. I think it's hard for people to understand, and I think that uh, having, having a community of folks who really do get it, and who you can talk to, and like, not getting too pissed off at the people who are like, what are you just screwing around? What are you doing? And you're like, look, I, I appreciate that, you know, though you work nine hours a day and I work two hours a day, I acknowledge like we, we both have important jobs and we're using our time and energy differently and that's okay. Like we don't all need to spend the same amount of time or do the same thing. Yeah, I, I hear you, man. I wish you every success with, with all your movies and you know, finding other people who, who do what we do and collaborating and commiserating and uh, that, that's always really great. And then working with people in different, in different fields. You know, film is such an exciting, such an exciting media. To, you can work with writers, with composers. Uh, the film, the field of virtual reality is so, so exciting now. Working with animators, um, working with historians, with medical people, working in, you know, people who are making protests, uh, making, you know, uh, working in protests or working in protest art. There's also, there's a lot of money to be had for projects uh, through grants as well. And depending on what we're making art about, I think just Googling you know, if you're making a movie about, uh, if you're making a movie about leukemia, you, you know, you could Google mo movie leukemia grant, and you might find that there's, you know, a $10,000 grant to make a movie about this where somebody has put money towards that. Uh, and that's exciting too. So going and finding the funding for the projects, there's more money to be had than we think. Uh, but I wish you every success with your movies, man. What's it like to get myself prepared every night to perform The Lion? So. I perform the line at eight o'clock for the most part every night. Uh, it's um, seven o'clock on Sundays, uh, and I've got I've got a mat matinees both on Saturday and Sunday, so two shows a day on Saturday and Sunday. I, I eat exactly three hours before the show uh, because if I eat an hour before the show, I'll be really hiccupy during my singing, and if I eat four hours before, uh, I my blood sugar will tank in the middle of the show, 
I actually once forgot that I had gotten cancer and just like skipped over it. <laughs> I was really in an, in an early rehearsal and my director was like, mm, let's just stop for a second. You forgot an important part. So I've got to eat at exactly the right time. Uh, I don't talk a lot during the day uh, just to sort of look after, look after my voice. Uh, when I really was doing the show when we opened in New York City, I was very uh, abstemious. I didn't drink any alcohol. I didn't drink any coffee. I'd go to the gym in the morning. I'd take a two-hour nap every afternoon. Uh, I, I've eased off on my uh, on my sort of monastic behavior since I since I've been on tour. Uh, but I get to the so I eat at five o'clock, and I'm usually very very tired around then, and I sort of become a sort of hibernating bear, and and I emerge around six thirty. And yeah, really from two o'clock until five, I'm just kind of doing nothing. Five o'clock I eat and at 6.30 I start to kind of wake up a little bit. I get to the theater at seven o'clock and all my guitars are, there are seven guitars in the show. They're all tuned differently. This one right here is tuned C, G, D, G, C, E. That's a, an, an alternate tuning. You tune a guitar to a different chords. Uh, and so my, these seven guitars are on stage, all tuned differently, and then I'll sort of go around and play each one, and I love my guitars very much. Uh, and so I'll warm up for half an hour with my guitars on stage, then I'll go backstage and put on my costume. I wear a microphone in my hair, it's hidden, and it's, the microphone pack is attached with a bra back, uh, in my back, and the suit that I'm wearing is cut to hide this. And so then from 7.30 until 8 o'clock, I'll warm up vocally in my dressing room, uh, I like to, I've been keeping a, a journal for the last few shows. It was my college poetry professor said, you should keep a journal the last few shows and then send me a poem about it. Uh, and, and I'm sitting in my dressing room and I like to write letters backstage too. Just think about the people who I really dig. I, I've stopped reading the New York Times in my dressing room before the show. It just bums me out, man. <laughs> it just bums me out. Uh, and then I, I, go, I go and sit backstage uh, for the 10 minutes before the show. And uh, my guitar tech is back there. And I chat with him and just sort of try to focus all of my energy and all of my adrenaline. And when they give me the warning and my, the guitar tech opens the door, I try to just snap into as much energy as I possibly can and stay very, very focused. And as as for the emotion of the show, that's a, really, that's a really good question. How do I get into the emotions of the show? You know, my father dying when I was 13, my having, my having cancer just after I'd broken up in, with a relationship. Well, for me, in order for the emotions to exist in the show, the way they want to exist is in the audience, right? The, it's, my job is to make sure the audience feel these emotions. And whether or not I myself feel them is really very, is irrelevant. When I'm on stage performing, that's what I'm doing. I'm the vehicle through which these emotions can be understood clearly by the audience. And so as a writer, my job is to live in these emotions, is to remember what something felt like viscerally and really try to get there and then try to craft it so it stimulates those feelings in an audience. But if I feel sad or scared or sick, which are emotions we'd like to try and evoke when we're talking about different things. If I feel those things while I'm performing, I'm not gonna do a good job performing because I'm gonna feel sad and scared and sick, which is not a helpful way to be focused. Uh, and so my job is to, as a writer, to write the words clearly enough that when I get on stage, I can just say them and not have the emotions live in the saying of it. You know, I don't need to say I'm sad in a sad way. If somebody says they're sad, you know they're sad. Uh, and so my focus is, is to not be emotional, but to just be a, a channel for who's ever writing I'm singing. If it's my own, then, uh, then I gotta make my writing good enough. It was David Mamet, uh, the playwright, who wrote in his book, True and False. He's like, yeah, your job as an actor is to say the words. And if, you know, if the writing's good, your job is done. If the writing's bad, it's not your problem. And I thought, well, okay, as the writer, it is my problem, but I really gotta make my focus on the writing. Because I'm not an actor, I never intended to be an actor. I really am, I'm not gonna go be in somebody else's play now. Uh, but I am a writer, so I thought, I can put all my energy to writing, so I don't have to worry about being a lousy actor, which I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the question was, uh, I, my relationship with my father, uh, did, uh, did cancer offer me a way, or, or writing about cancer offer me a way 
uh, uh, did it affect my relationship with my dad? Is, is that? Yeah, did, I, did those emotions merge together? You're speaking to emotions and your relationship with your father. I'm wondering all this is boiling down to a, a common point. To a common point. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. So uh, my father died before he was uh, 50 of a brain aneurysm. My grandfather died before he was 50 of alcoholism. My great-grandfather and grandmother died before they were 50 in Auschwitz or murdered in Auschwitz. So when I got cancer, uh, I was determined to break the cycle of the men in my family dying before they were 50. Uh, and, uh, and when I did and I started writing this show, it was Sean Daniels, the director, he was like, listen, Ben, this isn't a show about cancer. No, this is a show about your father. This is a show about family. He said, if the point of the show is it's not the roar that makes the lion, it's the pride. If that's the, what makes a lion a lion, what makes a person the person, and your answer is it's family, then that's what you're talking about. He said, cancer is the way that your character in the show, Ben, learns that. Uh, and as I, so my father and I, we got into a really big fight uh, when I was 13. And before we resolved it, he died. He had the brain aneurysm. We never resolved it. And... I've been racked with guilt since then, you know, into my 20s, feeling like I killed my dad, basically. Feeling like I upset my father and then he died. And, and at the, I knew I had to write a song at the end of the show where my character, Ben, and the dad character made peace uh, so, the pe so the show could come to a resolution. And so, uh, but I didn't know how to do this. And so when I was writing the show, the way I would procrastinate is I'd write postcards. Uh, I'd supposed to be writing a song, I'd be writing a postcard. And, and Sean, director, he came into my, we were up at a writer's retreat in Vermont in April 2013 at the Weston Playhouse, really beautiful place, looking out onto a stream. And, uh, and I'm sitting at my desk and I'm writing postcards. And Sean came in, he said, how, how's the song coming? I said, oh, I'm just writing postcards. And he said, have you ever written a postcard to your father? And then I burst into tears, and Sean felt really bad, so he bought some bacon and cooked me bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I was talking with my, another songwriting friend who said, listen, there's really only so many things that we all want to hear. We want to hear, I'm sorry. We want to hear, I forgive you. We want to hear, you've done a great job. Uh, and, and so I wrote a song then called Dear Dad. After, uh, after I started, it started with this postcard and it was really, really hard because normally songwriting for me is looking backwards and writing about a thing that's happened. Writing this song to my father required me to actually make peace with him and think, well, what would I say to my dad? And in doing that, it's really, what am I saying to myself? And the lyric in that song begins, I'm sorry about that note. I wrote my father a mean note. I said, sorry about that note I wrote. I don't think that it killed you, though. I've come to learn that sometimes bad things happen without reason. We get sick and sometimes die. I've carried all this guilt with me. Now it's time to set it free. So my dear father, please forgive me all the things that I did wrong. I was a very small boy. And, and it didn't even rhyme. It was just like the things. And so uh, sometimes saying the simplest thing in the clearest language, often saying the simplest thing in the clearest language carries the most powerful message. And so it was understanding what it is that I needed to say to my father, which allowed me, I made peace with my past so I could then move forward to my, to my future. And I've gotten to know my dad a lot better by writing this show. I, I like him a lot more now. And as I get older, I realize I'm more and more like him. You know, he was, he was my age, and I'll be, I'll be 35 in May. He was my age, and he was 34 when he had me. Uh, and so that's been fascinating, getting to know my father and myself through writing. So for me, writing is both sort of exploration of my past, but also like underst understanding of the, of the future. That's been powerful stuff for me. Uh, yeah, the, the question was, as a, when, I was, when I got cancer, I was 28. As a young person, it must have been very isolating. And did I seek out other people who had cancer? Uh, I did not seek out other young people who had cancer when I was ill. Uh, the mo most specifically because I didn't want to spend time with any new people when I was ill. I wanted to see my closest friends and my family and that was it. Uh, the new people who were in my life were cancer related. They were my doctor, my doctor's uh, nurse, 
by the way, on, oncology nurses are the most wonderful people in the whole world. Uh, and and I, I didn't seek out other folks. Uh, I did read the column in the New York Times by an art, a writer called Sulaika Jawad, who wrote a column called Life Interrupted. And she was 23 when she got diagnosed with very, very serious kind of cancer. Uh, and she was a friend of a friend. So she and I met up and we became, we became friends. But I didn't go to any sort of support groups or that sort of thing. Uh, uh, that was just a personal decision. There's plenty of people who I know find great value in that. I've since been introduced to other people who had the kind of cancer that I had. Uh, though I will say, I, start, I was introduced to a personal trainer, you know, an exercise person, who had had the same kind of cancer as me, and we started exercising once a week together. I knew that I wanted to try and look after my body while I was ill. And I knew that she would be the right person. It was my oncologist who connected me with her. We also had the same birthday. Uh, so I feel like I, I felt real kinship to her. So I, I suppose it's not entirely true to say, no, I didn't seek out cancer, other folks who'd had cancer. I did, but in very specific ways. And I didn't, I didn't go to a you know, support group or that kind of thing. Yeah, but that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I think a lot of people, and especially online, there's a lot of great support to be found, especially in something that's, that's so isolating to be able to find a community. And then, yes, what kind of positive aspects are there from getting something like cancer? Well, I think we can assign understanding and creativity to that which we undergo. Uh, I think as artists, we can make art about, about anything. And if you're eating a bowl of Cheerios in the morning, you can write a beautiful song about that. If you get cancer, that's less, that's less fun, but you can still write a song about it. I'm, I'm certainly not of the idea that you need bad things to happen in order to write good music or in order to make a good painting, in order to write a good book. I think it's, it's hard to write, to make art about anything. Uh, it's possible to make art about anything. Uh, but given my circumstances, whatever happens, uh, I, I always believe that making art is a really valuable thing. Uh, I enjoy it. It allows me a sense of control. It allows me a sense of connection where once I had isolation, it allows me a way to make good things out of bad things. And so I, I suppose from, from getting cancer, I've uh, having made this work, I've, I've made so many new friends. I've gotten to travel the United States and the world. I've gotten to make, to make a record and to make a book and to make music videos and to meet people I never dreamed I would meet and to raise money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, a society that I did not know existed until I got sick. Uh, and to hear when people come see the lion, to hear people say, hey man, I gotta tell you, your story is exactly like my story. And then they tell me a story that seems on the surface to have nothing to do with my story at all. But I've come to realize that it's not that our stories are the same thing, but it, that we feel the same way about whatever happens with us. We feel sad, we feel happy, we feel loss, we feel love, we feel connection with ourselves, with other people, that's all. What do I define as perfection in my work? That is a very good question. Well, I suppose in, uh, let, let's look at two different things. Let's look at performance and, and in writing. Uh, in performance, there's, there's really no such thing as perfection. I can try to listen to my director and always stay in my light and not mess up the words that I'm saying, but that which I have to play with is an audience and timing. <laughs> and, and I do it differently every night and, and I'll always try different things and some things work better than others but I don't think there's such a thing as perfection uh, in, in writing uh, I, don't, I certainly don't think there's such a thing as perfection but I, I do think I, it, you stop at a certain point when you're writing and the simple answer of when do you stop changing your writing well if you're a playwright you keep changing it until opening night you, that's really, and that's when you have to stop by union rules. But you can, you can always tighten up your writing. You know, you know, if you've got a two-syllable word where a one-syllable word works better, great. If you've got the word "and" where you don't need it, cut it. Uh, if if you tell the same joke twice, cut the cut the less good one and just tell it once. Uh, uh, Jeff Crayley, my record producer, was asked, "Hey, when you're in the recording studio, you know, and you're just not feeling it, like what?" What do you do? And Jeff's like, listen to me. The reason you practice six or eight 
or 10 hours a day, and this is what you should be doing. He said, the reason you do that is not so your moments of brilliance are any more brilliant. It's so your level of suck is so high <laughs> that you can always deliver. And, and similarly, that person said, well, Jeff, when do you know if a song's finished? And he said, well, it depends on if you want it to be finished or you want it to be good. If you want it to be finished, stop, you're done. If you want it to be good, <laughs> write another draft. Uh, uh, Stephen Sondheim's essay, Rhyme and Its Reasons, is a really important essay to me. It's in his book, Finishing the Hat. And Sondheim, the master of musical theater uh, writing, who, of course, wrote West Side Story and Sweeney Todd, among many other wonderful, wonderful shows. Uh, he talks about using perfect rhyme and why rhyme is good. You know, every three-year-old knows rhyme is funny. You read them Dr. Seuss, and they crack up when words rhyme. But it's interesting thinking, why is rhyme funny? And what does rhyme allow us to do as, as writers? Uh, uh, why in a hip hop battle, when you're making fun of somebody else, if, you're li if your biggest joke rhymes, why is that a better joke? We all know it is. It's, all f it's always funnier. It always lands harder, but why? That's really interesting. And so I always, a perfect rhyme is always better than not an imperfect rhyme, or m almost always better. Uh, if something scans really elegantly, meaning if the words sound the way you're talking. Uh, if, you have, um, if you have the melody, Barida, you can say spaghetti, but if your melody is ba da da, you can't say spaghetti because nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> so your melody and your words have to line up together. So that's called scansion. So how good is your scansion? How good are your rhymes? How much? How does it flow? How clear is it? Have you gotten rid of all your cliches? You know, is there something that kind of sounds like somebody else's writing, or something where you're really not telling the truth that hard? Or have you kind of heard this phrase before? You know, th I will always try to dig a little bit deeper and, and always strive to make the next song, the next song a little bit better and a little bit more honest and, and you know, try to steal from as many people as I can. You know, if you're, if you're a folk songwriter but you, you only steal from Bob Dylan, like, you're not that good. But if you're a folk songwriter and you steal from Bob Dylan and Steinbeck and Eminem and Mozart's librettist De Ponte and Gilbert and Sullivan and T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and Shakespeare, the more, and you steal from 200 people, you're a genius. You steal from one person, you're, you're just a hack. And so, you know, the more, the more, things you can take and synthesize and spit back out as honestly as you can, I think that's, that's how we get closer to perfection. I don't know that being perfect is ever really that interesting, but I think, you know, trying to be original and compelling is interesting. And, and so with that, friends, I thank you for being original and compelling with me this evening.